Aphrodite in Love Short Romance Story by Misha Quinn All Rights Reserved Copyright 2023 Narrated by Mickminster Synthetic Voice, Pro Max License, 2023 Aphrodite in Love the beautiful goddess of love, Aphrodite, looked at the guy stomping at her feet. But in fact, the goddess was not on Olympus but standing in a museum. And she was there in an image created for her by a talented sculptor of antiquity. This image was like a statue of a female figure made of white marble. Although the body was marble in this incarnation, Aphrodite's soul was filled with feelings and memories. It was sculpted out of marble by a great sculptor thousands of years ago. Then, the statue was lost and found many millennia later. During this time, the skillful coloring and decorations of the figure had dissolved in the sands of time, and only white marble remained. But even this appearance was enough for people to appreciate again the beauty and greatness of the sculptor's idea. Although the marble was cold and seemingly emotionless, this cold marble body was now quite fitting for Aphrodite. The goddess of love was everywhere and anywhere. Still, she often enjoyed moving into works of art and directly receiving the admirer's rapture of her beauty. In principle, Aphrodite did not care how she was portrayed, as long as the image evoked admiration and adoration of her eternal beauty. Many generations of women and men have appreciated and recognized the matchless beauty of Aphrodite, this is how the persona that the sculptor embodied in marble has been defined by historians and connoisseurs of art. Many took her image as the standard of female beauty. However, Aphrodite recognized only the diversity of female forms, considering them the most exciting phenomenon of nature. Every day, hundreds of visitors pass by the statue of Aphrodite. Some of them passed by, glancing at her beautiful but almost naked body, and, embarrassed, hurried away. Others stopped before the statue and studied every inch for a long time, trying to find the answer to the question of true beauty. Yes, Aphrodite's beauty was worshipped by more than one generation of women and men. Still, this worship was Aphrodite's habitual worship. Today, however, Aphrodite was amused. She was amused by how a modern young man studied her statue. He was walking around, measuring the proportions of the figure of the goddess's image, and transferring it into a laptop. But there was no adoration or rapture in the gaze of this admirer. The young man was looking at the statue of the goddess of love rather indifferently. He measured it with some complicated-looking instruments and carefully entered the data of changes into the laptop. Aphrodite was aware of the modern technology people use nowadays. She was well-versed in art and knew there was always good and bad style. It was not the first time she had been used to people walking around her in togas, then in tall hats and canes, and now in some strange clothes, the names she had not yet remembered. However, people in the museum have yet to talk about these clothes. Only women and men wore blue pants with pockets and seams, tuned with double stitching. These pants were tight or left their wearer's legs free depending on the current fashion. These clothes were like the workman's clothes used a couple of centuries ago, first by sailors and then by common laborers. Now, it seemed worn by everyone, men and women alike. Only a small select group of people who occasionally visited the museum dressed exquisitely and looked like aristocrats of the past. Now, in her opinion, this young man was one of those who dressed badly. He was wearing these awful blue pants with pants that were too wide. Aphrodite looked at the strange museum visitor and thought about why he needed to measure the proportions of her sculpture. After all, in her opinion, no measurements would help to understand when the creator of an outstanding work of art would create a masterpiece, and when he would create a hack, a so-called common object. Such an object does not need to be hack work. It is simply what the creators say about what is made for sale based on the needs of the existing buyers and their tastes. But what the painter or sculptor himself recognizes as a work of art, an object unique, which cannot be repeated, is often not sold or, in the lifetime of its creator, cannot get a proper appreciation from contemporaries. It was such a unique work of art that this sculpture of Aphrodite, in which the soul of the goddess of love now lived, was impressive. During the lifetime of its creator, the sculpture was recognized as just an ordinary statue, another representation of the goddess of love. 
but as the millennia passed, most of the other statues of Aphrodite were lost, and those that survive to this day became rare and were recognized and worshipped worldwide by true admirers of art. However, Aphrodite heard this strange guy turn to a girl in her early twenties who had just approached him. So, did you write it all down, Paola? The girl, without looking at the boy, replied. Yes, Rawl, I wrote it all down. You're going to think I'm as clueless as… She did not finish. Paola's voice was full of ill-concealed irritation. She doesn't like the guy Aphrodite thought would surprise. However, this girl was interested in the goddess. This young lady was short, dressed in dark-colored clothes, and looked like a modern goth. Still, not her appearance attracted attention, but her intelligent gaze could be seen if you looked closely at her face. In addition, the lack of piercings and tattoos suggested that this museum visitor needed help understanding the image she was attracted to. That the girl had no tattoos was already said a lot. Aphrodite knew tattoos meant a lot to those who got them of their own volition. She did not understand how anyone could voluntarily go through the pain and other risks of getting a tattoo, unless there was a good reason for it. But today's youth, and not only youth, have a simple attitude toward tattoos. Aphrodite thought about how tattoos change in a person's skin as they age. Often, they become a disgusting sight. Only when you are young does no one want to think about it. Oh well. Okay, the girl suits me thought the goddess, turning her attention to the guy. So, what do we have here? Rawl was a lean, brisk and businesslike fellow of about 25. He was doing his work, measuring the statue's proportions, and did not notice the girl constantly glancing at him. Aphrodite was pleased with the observations. Well, I've got a classic case here. Both are interested in each other, but don't know how to show it or they can't find the right moment. The goddess sighed, and a light breeze blew through the hall like a draft from an open door. And just like that, they can walk side by side for days and months and years. And none of them will dare to say what's in their hearts. Well, my job is to help people like that, and that's what I will do. The goddess stopped seeing the pair of young men. Her inner gaze returned to her happy years when she loved and was loved, only all of that was gone. The goddess was immortal, and this immortality did not bring the oblivion that helps people move on after their losses or mistakes. Aphrodite remembered everything that had happened in her life. And now the cheeks of the marble statue turned pink from the tenderness with which the memories of the goddess were imbued. The statue's eyelids fluttered, and a gleam appeared in its marble eyes. A tear rolled down her cheek and landed on the girl's hand. Paola shuddered and looked up at the statue around which she and Rawl were taking measurements. The girl froze, gazing in wonder at the statue's face. The sun's rays slid across the white marble, giving it warmth and color. The figure seemed to reach out to Paola and say something. The girl reached out to the statue and touched its marble surface. The figure was cold, and its colors were only an illusion created by the sun's slanting rays that penetrated the museum hall through an ancient window with elaborately colored stained glass. The girl shook her head, brushing those thoughts away. I can't be imagining all this. And I'll keep imagining things like this until I dare to tell Rawl how much I like him. Instead of continuing her thought, the girl turned to Rawl, kissing the words carelessly through tightly compressed lips. You know I'm tired. Let's go somewhere and have coffee. Rawl, who was at that moment behind the statue, looked out from behind it and stared at Paola with great surprise. To have coffee? He said mechanically and uncertainly. Well, why are you repeating my words like a parrot? Yeah, we should have coffee just the two of us. You don't have to wait for someone from your employee group to show up Paola replied with a not covered sarcasm. Rawl lowered both hands, holding a notebook and a pencil. Okay, good. Sure, we can go to the cafe he said, confused. But, of course, Aphrodite knew he liked the suggestion. The guy gathered his things into his bag, slung it over his shoulder, and looked expectantly at the girl. She also quickly gathered her belongings, which had been placed around the statue, into her large work bag, and, without looking back at Aphrodite, said in a suddenly joyful voice, I know a cafe here that makes great coffee. 
Do you like coffee made in metal cups on hot sand, right? Rawl suddenly lost all his exaggeratedly serious look and, with a boyish shake of his head, smiling broadly replied, yes, that's the coffee I like. But how do you know that? The girl who had seemed so determined and collected before was embarrassed. Paola realized she had given herself away, and her sullen image disappeared. She looked into Rawl's eyes and answered, well after all, I've been working beside you for a couple of months. It's been time to notice what you like. Rawl stood dumbfounded by his sudden realization. Despite her strange and gloomy image, he had always been with her, this attentive and pretty girl, and he had not even realized that she was interested in him. What a fool I am. He scolded himself. I thought she couldn't stand me. Rawl paused momentarily, then walked over to Paola and took the heavy bag of work materials from her shoulder. The girl looked at him with a look of surprise that was immediately replaced by gratitude and understanding. This was how it was supposed to be in her dreams. In Paola's dreams, Rawl always helped her. She had surrendered to his mercy and recognized that he was a man who could help her with things she could not easily handle on her own. But in real life, the girl showed she coped with everything alone. For example, she always carried her heavy work bags with tools by herself. Paola never gave Rawl, or any of the other male colleagues on their research team, a chance to be masculine and help her. It seemed to Paola that denying her feminine nature, denying that she was physically weaker than men, was a manifestation of equality with men. However, Aphrodite knew this was not something to impress the chosen one of her hearts. If you constantly deny manhood and prevent a man from being a man, it is not equality but chaos. There was something symbolic because Paola's bag was suddenly on the guy's shoulder. It was a victory for the goddess of love. That Paola had surrendered and shown her femininity for the first time since she had known Rawl spoke volumes. The girl could show the man he could care for her. That was how a new love was born. Or rather, love already lived in these two's hearts. Only neither wanted to admit it. Aphrodite thought, contemplating with a slight chuckle the newly revealed feeling these two had for each other. Well, another couple has been born. I don't want to think about how long their love will last. But the very birth of this feeling is a miracle of life that gives birth to a new life. Unfortunately, I am immortal, so my feelings cannot be as sharp as those of people who feel the transience of everything around them. But love is beautiful, though, for me, their love is only a moment in my life. But for these lovers, their love seems to be a lifetime long, forever. And that's what's beautiful about people. So happy that I could give them this discovery of themselves and each other. Aphrodite smiled contentedly. She was pleased with herself, and the day had brought her the pleasure of joining the souls of two people. She never tired of watching love find its way into people's hearts. This time, the goddess of love was pleased with herself and the life of these two souls, who had suddenly opened themselves to each other. While Aphrodite was immersed in her meditations on the miracle of love, the young people strolled toward the exit of the museum hall, smiling at each other, and talking about something unimportant to their research work, but which had become so important to them. The End Written by Misha Quinn, 2023 All rights reserved. Copyright Misha Quinn, 2023